Hi everyone, I'm Pamela Hastings and welcome you to another Barometer webcast. Thank you so much for joining me. Joining us today is David Burroughs, our Chief Investment Strategist and President here at Barometer. We have lots to talk about as we head into the U.S. election in just under two weeks. So with that, I turn the conversation over to David Burroughs and of course at the end of David's market update, we will be pleased to address your questions. Please email me at phastings at barometercapital.ca or send me a message via the chat and I'll be sure to address your questions. Thanks so much and hi, David. Happy uh, Wednesday afternoon. <laughs> Thanks, Pamela. Here we are, we're, we're now two weeks away from this election and, and uh, uh, if you watch the media and you watch the news, it is really about the only thing being discussed uh, along, alongside of the pandemic. And so there's obviously lots of questions, people trying to divine from markets uh, where things are going, uh, what they may or may should not be doing uh, leading into the election and, and maybe how they should be positioned. And so I thought I'd maybe take a little bit of a crack at that today. There's obviously lots of question marks. Uh, it is a tricky time of the year, uh, but I think that you have to, uh, have to focus on the process that got you here in the first place and and uh, and have some faith in that um just to 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 step back for a second uh to be clear we we aren't trying to be everywhere our process is is aimed at trying to through the quantitative work that we do identify pockets of market leadership to focus our client portfolios in uh, these are parts of the market where there is structural change taking place where things are going from good to better, uh, where we could see revaluation. So not only earnings growth, but multiple expansion. And that's really where you make a return in a bull market. It's not just in the earnings growth. It's where investors are realizing maybe they should pay a higher multiple for that business or for that sector because it happens to be in the right place at the right time. Uh, so we're trying to find that structural leadership uh, and focus in those areas. There's going to be big parts of the market that we avoid. We're always watching for signs of new leadership and what and, and what that could mean uh, in the way that people are shifting their opinions. We're going to talk a little bit about that today. Uh, and then, of course, there are the times when, when the tide is going out uh, and you have to recognize the wind is in your face and maybe it's better to keep your powder dry, keep some cash on the sidelines, exit a big part of the market, maybe something that has been working that has stopped working, uh, but you have to be able to play defense from time to time. And so we're obviously getting asked the question right now, is this one of those times? And people come at this from different directions. I'm going to come at it through our lenses. Uh, and, and this is an iterative process. We're always looking for new information. We're always looking for new indication that things are changing either for the better or for the worse. You know, this is quite a tactical approach. Um, the backdrop to be clear is that we have been in a structural bull market, right? A secular multi-year bull market that kicked off in 2013 as we exited this long sideways choppy market, the S&P and the, and, the, and the Dow was in from 2000 through 2013. We covered lots of ground, but made no progress. Very similar to the period between 1966 and 1982. Very similar to the period between 1929 and 1950-51. Um, once you're in a structural bull market, you definitely have uh, pullbacks. You can have short-term bear markets but they tend to be over quickly and it's like three steps forward for every one step backward. And we've clearly had some of those over the last few years. This is a more recent picture of the S&P, the breakout in 2013, the, the correction through 2015-16, that was the slowdown in China that impacted resources and the cyclical stocks. Uh, we then had another correction 2017-18 and this very sharp bear market that we had in the beginning of this year in February and into March. But since then, markets have been recovering. And you can see we've been in this channel now pretty consistently since 2013. You take the NASDAQ. NASDAQ broke out to new highs in 2016, and it has consistently been in this upward channel with lots of volatility. And we are above that channel at this point. 
which means that the NASDAQ had a particularly strong run through the summer, but the long-term picture continues to look pretty constructive here. We know that a lot of the strength has been driven by liquidity in the market, right? We can line up a long list of things that markets should be concerned about, right? We should be concerned about the long-term economic impact that certain industries are feeling through the, the, the catalyst of this pandemic. We know that debt levels are higher for some parts of the population. We know that uh, we know that certain industries have had, had a real challenge. On the other hand, there have been industries who have had their business models really accelerated by two to three years, and it's been a really good thing for them. But the net of it is there's the old saying, don't fight the Fed. Uh, and we know that in previous crises, the Fed and others have pushed money into the system to try and buoy asset prices to main, maintain liquidity in the system. And there hasn't ever been a time like the one we've been in over the course of this year. Now, the market's been obsessing about the potential for additional fiscal stimulus, which, of course, the politicians have had a very difficult time coming to grips with. Uh, it appears that we are probably too close to an election to really see a deal get done prior to the election. But, you know, day by day, people are watching for it. There are gyrations in the market uh, and there are implications. The S&P 500 made a high on the 1st of September. It corrected in two steps down into the end of October, rallied back into the resistance that it had been in uh, on the way down, break broke through, and now has been consolidating over the last two weeks. So the question is, do we make a double top in the market and see the market roll over? Or do we see the market break out of this little flag that it's been in while the market's been consolidating and continue to head higher? So you can try and guess what should happen. You can look at uh, the message of the market underneath the surface to try and see what is happening. And that's sort of what we prefer to do. The NASDAQ, as you know, has been the strongest part of the market. And it similarly has been consolidating over the last seven days. Now, just as an aside, the market is remarkable in that it has cycles that play over and over again. And there are certain long-term weekly cycles, daily cycles. It's rare to have more than in a very short period of time, a seven day cycle where you're correcting, you tend to have some recovery coming out of that, but we'll wait and see whether we come out of this flag to the upside or to the downside but we're gonna try and define that in the call today. As you know, we have three basic pieces to our process and I won't belabor it. Uh, we run this top-down model, which helps us to understand the market environment we're in. The question is, is more money getting put to work day by day or are we seeing money taken out of the market? Are more stocks participating in a rally, which is healthy, expanding breadth, or is breadth deteriorating? The weaklings within certain groups selling off, meaning that the floor is getting a little thinner underneath us and we try to identify areas of market leadership where breadth is expanding. Those are our target areas to invest. The bottom up work we do is to, we take the broad population of publicly traded securities. We run them through some tests, looking for some very quantitative fundamental characteristics in the income statement, the balance sheet. Again, looking for things that are improving, good getting better. And where the prices of those securities would support that view and where we can find fundamentally improving companies with strong uh, price charts and they pass due diligence, they become eligible to be invested in. And so our portfolios really are the combination of those two things, finding groups within the market that we wanna focus our attention in, areas of structurally positive change, companies within those groups that meet our business tests that are good getting better and that have prices that would support that view. And then we run that process every single day. Now, the reality is the important part of that process is that you always have to be pruning it, taking out the weaker positions, adding new strength. And so we have a very disciplined selling strategy, which we talk about often. We run stop losses on our positions. And should uh, individual positions not behave the way they should, given what we think we know, and they have relatively poorer performance, they become eligible to be sold, to move on, to be replaced with stronger positions. 
If there are new areas of leadership, we look for the strongest company we can find within that group to start a partial position, and then we'll add to it on strength. So we're always moving towards strength. We're always trying to understand, are we comfortable with behavior in the, in the, in the specific asset class like equities? What sectors give us the best breadth improvement and then which securities meet our business tests? Okay, so let's talk a little bit about that today. Um, we're always looking for improving breadth. And when we see contracting breadth, we wanna be reducing positions, reducing our exposure and being more cautious. So, okay, so what did we learn over the last week? Well, we're in earnings season. So it's the beginning. Uh, we've had about 50 companies report, a few more companies reported today. Uh, nobody expected the earnings and sales would be strong relative to the same quarter last year. Uh, but revenue has been down about 3% for the entire market versus last year. Now there's disparity there, obviously, Energy has been particularly weak, weak oil prices, you know, industrials relatively weak versus last year because of less economic activity. Certain areas like healthcare, of course, uh, have not been hurt. Consumer staples, people things buy every day, but those areas are up from a revenue perspective. From an earnings perspective, earnings year over year down about 18.8% .8 so far in the quarter. And again, disparity between groups. Probably though what's more important is how are companies reporting earnings relative to what has been expected coming into the quarter? And on that front, it's certainly more positive. The average company has beaten the revenue estimates by about 3.3%, but earnings have beaten the estimate by about 22%. So whether it is that companies have become cautious in what they are letting the street believe they might be able to earn, or whether it is that the analysts are being cautious and making their estimates, or whether it is just that conditions are actually a little better than what people thought, earnings are coming in ahead and really across the board for virtually all sectors. Employment. Well, the most recent employment number was a little bit worse as far as continuing claims go, but unemployment continues to drop. So we are nowhere near where we were a year ago we are elevated, but things continue to improve. A few other things that we look at. Uh, we look at the freight index, uh, expenditures on moving things from here to there. This is stuff that is being sold. And we have had a very, very sharp recovery in the freight indices. And we've seen that in the transports. That's a positive. New business, uh, small business optimism has really come back very, very quickly and new business formation has been very strong. You know, when you go through a crisis like this, it sets up opportunities that people step into and say, I'm gonna form a business to try and take advantage of this. And so we've seen some improving uh, business optimism. In China, interesting. This is the exchange rate of the Chinese Yuan. This is a strengthening currency, the number of Yuan it takes to buy a dollar. A year ago, we were concerned because the Chinese were apparently devaluing their currency to make themselves more competitive. As their economy strengthens, their currency should strengthen. It is strengthening. And this is the steepness of their yield curve. Their 10-year yields are headed higher. That happens when the economy is improving and people believe that it is likely in the future rates will be higher. These are two signs that the Chinese economy is going through improvement. Now let's talk about the models that we look at. A week ago, we highlighted the fact that breadth or the percentage of stocks globally that are in uptrends had started to improve. So through September, there has been, had been some weakness. We saw improving breadth globally for equities. And again, this week, it is more of the same. When we look at all stocks in the US, breadth again, strong this week, not weakening. So why is that important? Because we all look at news and we all look at all of the various levers that can impact markets. And as I say often, the market is made up of a thousand moving parts, but the output that comes out of the market is a product of all of those moving parts. New information gets introduced every day. It gets factored in. So we have found that over time, if more and more companies are participating in a rally, 
it means that investor confidence and sentiment is improving, is getting more confident, not less confident. It means that if a bad piece of news comes out of the blue, the market is set up to absorb news effectively. Right? The single most important thing you can look at in a market is the market's ability to absorb bad news. In a bear market, a small piece of news is taken very, very negatively. So we've been watching the market uh, go back and forth and investors be concerned about whether or not we're going to get fiscal stimulus. It's becoming pretty clear it's unlikely. They may still throw a Hail Mary before the election, not that likely. And I think lots of people have been concerned if they don't pass a fiscal stimulus before the election, markets get hurt. But in fact, markets been consolidating over the last week while we've been continually disappointed by the fact that they have not been able to get together and breadth is actually improving. That tells us the market's on a pretty good footing. Now, three weeks ago, our indicators were solidly negative. Market was correcting through the month of September. Our long-term breadth reading for Canada was weak. The long-term breadth reading for the US was weakening, meaning fewer and fewer stocks were holding up. Same thing globally. We have some short-term indicators that we look at, the percent of stocks trading above their 50-day moving average or short-term moving average, that had been deteriorating across the board. The percent of stocks making new highs versus making new lows had been weakening, meaning fewer stocks are making new highs and more stocks are making new lows and the percent of stocks trading above their 150 day or 30 week moving average, that's a long-term moving average, had been weakening. Here's the picture today. It's a lot better. Now, Canada continues to lag and the Canadian market continues to be down sort of nine, 10% off the highs. US market strongest in the world, breadth has been improving. Global breadth is improving. Percent of stocks with positive weekly momentum, that's upward trajectory. That number is expanding, not contracting. So as we're heading into this uncertainty, market is not deteriorating, it's hanging in and in fact strengthening. So remember the last election, the concern was if Trump won, market was gonna sell off 10%. And then the market took off like a rocket the day he got elected. The market was on a strong technical footing going into the news. So I would say that based on this work, the market's assessment currently of the situation is not something that is deteriorating, it's something that's improving. The internals are improving. Now, I think this is interesting. You know, we can track a futures market on people's expectations for where things are going. And you can see that for the Republican candidates in 2020, this has been weakening since March. And we're sitting ultimately at about the lowest level we've been at a 20% probability of a Republican win. And on the other side, the, the futures probability for a Democrat win has been steadily improving, sitting now at about 80%. Now we can still get surprises, but apparently investors are becoming more confident in a Democrat win and less confident in a Republican win. Often this would be seen as negative for markets but again, the market is absorbing this news. The potential new taxes and spending that could come from the Democrats does not appear to be shaking the market's confidence. I pointed out last week that fixed income breadth or the bond market was starting to show some weakness and that's continued. So after consolidating through the course of the pandemic and prices for government bonds being very high and very broadly owned, we are see a weakening in bond prices, which tends to mean one of two things. It means either that people are concerned about credit risk, or it means that people believe that in the future, economic growth will be stronger and inflation will be a little stronger. We see no signs of concern in the credit side of things. So this is telling us that the market is getting more confident that the economy can start to reaccelerate on the other side of this pandemic. Now, that's not the only clue. We look at the steepness of the curve, the difference between a short term bond, which has lower interest rate currently, and a long term bond. And what is the differential between those two yields? And we can see that really over the course of the last two years, we've been seeing the curve steepen. 
we consolidated for a long time and it's steepening again. So that again points to expectation that the market has that things are going to continue to improve. Other signs. When we look at the price of copper, it's just made a new high and it's rallying relative to gold. That's an offensive asset versus a defensive asset. So copper showing us strength. Other signs, we talked last week about materials in general being strong on a relative basis versus the market. We've seen that continue on through the course of this week. This is the price chart of Freeport, McMoran, Copper and Gold, one of the biggest copper producers in the world, a $25 billion market cap, made new absolute highs today and new relative highs versus the market. That is not a sign of investors being concerned about economic activity. We talked last week about industrials having a strong relative couple of weeks versus the market. We've talked about semiconductors leading the market, making a new relative high just a week ago. Now they've consolidated a little bit this week. But again, if you think the economy is going to slow down or the, or the market is going to weaken, this is a group that you want to watch. We're not seeing a sign of it. We talked last week about the fact that higher yields mean dividend growth should do a little better than high dividend paying stocks that continued over the course of the week. Banks, banks are very economically sensitive. And whether we're looking at regional banks or the big US banks, this is the last three weeks. This is the ETF of regional banks moved from $34 to $40. And on a relative basis, very strong versus the market. So these are all clues that investors are looking beyond this next two weeks beyond the election, perhaps beyond the pandemic or the current state of the pandemic, to say that prices today are reasonable given the lineup of things that we're fighting with the backdrop of fiscal and monetary stimulus. Transportation continues to be very strong on a relative basis versus the market. Expeditors International made a new high today. The rails have been very strong. And then we look at the US dollar. So the US dollar has a tendency to strengthen when people are seeking safety. And it tends to weaken when people are willing to take that safe haven dollar, convert it to other currency and buy riskier, more economically sensitive markets. And you can see that the market backed up during September when the US stock market pulled back, but since then has been weakening and had a big down day today Again, that's a sign of risk acceptance. So we look outside of the US and the emerging markets ETF making its first new high going back to February. The Chinese stock market making a new high. We've been talking about the Chinese consumer ETF CHIQ and the Chinese web ETF KWeb, all of them being very strong relative to the US stock market. So I'm going to say in general, basic materials, transportation stocks, semiconductor companies, emerging markets, all are assets that people buy when they feel that things are getting better. So our breadth models are improving, risk indicators are improving, the bond market, that safe haven is backing off, people are releasing or selling bonds and more willing to buy, it, buy some of these risk assets that are under owned. These are the areas we're focused. TSX is a dark spot, still down 9.3% off the high in February. The makeup of our Canadian market, not as friendly, so we're more focused in the US. And when we get to the sector weights, you can see really not much change. A little bit of a bump up in our industrials exposure, a little bit of a bump up in the consumer discretionary exposure a little bit of a bump down in consumer staples. Very little, virtually nothing in real estate and energy, communication services, the phone companies, again, not economically sensitive, long duration assets tend to do better when people are seeking safety. So what do we do leading into the election? I think we gotta to continue to watch and we can continue to monitor for change. Over the last few weeks, things are improving. Now, if we don't get a stimulus, maybe there is a bit of bumpiness between now and the end of October. But I think most people have come to the conclusion that it's really a bit of a toss up at this point and unlikely 
that these two warring parties are going to get together and, and agree on a stimulus package. So I'll leave you with one simple statistic. Forget about the news of the day. The third quarter was a great quarter. For the S&P, it was up eight and a half percent. And I have to tell you, I did not expect that. We focused on our sector exposures and our company exposures, but if you'd asked me in August, I would have said, or in July, I would have said, I would expect some bumpiness through the summer. Now, it was a great quarter. So when we go back to 1950 and take all the strong third quarters where the mark was up over seven and a half percent, fourth quarter generally comes in pretty well. So historically, I know in our case, our fourth quarter has almost always been the best quarter of the year, especially when you go into it with a strong fundamental and technical backdrop. Our technical work on internals is positive. When we put that together with years where you've had a strong third quarter, you know, you're likely to have a pretty strong finish to the year. So that remains to be seen. We're going to continue to watch every day. We're going to run the stops we have on our positions. We're going to continue to run our sector work. We're going to continue to run our market internal risk work. But at this point, we really don't see a reason to be a major seller into the election because when you think back to 2016, all of those bad things people thought would happen if Trump got elected did not happen. The market carried on. So elections are fun to read about uh, and they're important to, to debate. Uh, but in the end, they don't tend to have a huge impact on markets. Uh, and uh, so we're just gonna, gonna move forward. If things start to weaken, we certainly will play defense. We've got a history of playing defense in a tough market. Um, and, uh, and our portfolios are, are varied across the board. Our equity strategy uh, now on the year is up about 24%. Uh, our long short strategy is up about 28%. They have been the most aggressively positioned. Uh, the income portfolio uh, has been well outperforming its benchmark, but income universe has still been kind of weak on the year because of concern about whether companies continue to pay dividends or not. Um, our portfolio has, uh, has great dividend growth built into it. Uh, the macro portfolio, which we were quite defensive with through the summer, uh, reversed at the end of September, beginning of October to a more offensive stance, given the current conditions uh, and, uh, and is set up to try and capture a strong fourth quarter. So with that, Pamela, if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, but uh, I want to thank everybody for joining us. Thanks, Dave. I think you touched on everything today. So we don't really have any additional questions. But uh, encourage everyone to tune in next Wednesday as we get closer to the election and inevitably people are going to be talking about it. So it's good for us to, to carry on and be able to address and speak to what we're doing to prepare our portfolios for this upcoming U.S. election. If things change, we'll certainly update in the interim. We're going to do another call next Wednesday. If you've got questions in the meantime, uh, or questions specifically about your own individual portfolios, we're certainly happy to talk. That's, that's one of the values of, of being a client at Barometer. We are available. Uh, and uh, I think it's good for you to have the ability to talk directly to the investment team uh, to get responses on questions. Uh, we try to be really transparent. That's the reason that we do these webcasts. We want you to understand our thinking. And, uh, and if you don't, or if I haven't been clear, please uh, shoot us a message or make a call and uh, we'll happy to clear it up. So thanks everybody for tuning in and we'll look forward to seeing you again next week. Thanks, Pam. Thanks everyone. We'll see you next week.